Hi, everyone. I'm Jo Mackay, Head of Local Publishing at the HQ, a division of HarperCollins. We welcome to our series of Her Story interviews, interviews with authors who write historical fiction from the point of view of female characters, and by doing so, give back voices to women. It's her story, not history. I am delighted to be interviewing today Tia Cooper. Tia now has six novels in print, including Historical Mysteries, The Naturalist's Daughter, The Woman in the Green Dress, and The Girl in the Painting, all set in 19th and early 20th century Australia and the UK. Tia, your novels always feature highly ingenious women with unusual professions, a natural scientist, a taxidermist, um, a, and in your most recent novel, a mathematical savant come amateur detective, determined to solve the mystery of her benefactress's past. Your characters are often uneasy fit with the time period in which they're born. What made you choose to write about this kind of character from this particular time period? I wrote those characters because they interest me. I want to explore their thinking and the effect it had on their lives. Um, But many women had professions at that time. Um, And many of those professions professions could be termed unusual. But that's the fault of history. We haven't heard their stories. History was written by men and women rarely got the recognition they deserved. It dates back hundreds of years. The Dutch cartographers in the 14th century were all women but they were forced to sign their work with their husband's name. Ada Lovelace, the mathematician who lived in the first half of the 19th century, is only now being recognised for her contribution to computer science. Everybody remembers that she was Lord Byron's only legitimate daughter, nothing else. Mary Anning, the paleontologist, is another woman who only recently has been acknowledged for her work. Elizabeth MacArthur did far, did far more for the Australian wool industry than her husband. He was too busy swanning backwards and forwards to England and fighting court cases. It can go on forever. So although my characters are fictional, I don't think that they're that unusual. I'm simply giving a fictional voice to women whose stories are untold. Tia, you once told me that your approach to plotting followed a jigsaw method. Uh, You piece together stories you've heard from the past and kind of weave your narrative around them. What effect does this have on your storytelling? I, I like to weave fact, historical facts into my stories, and I hope it gives the story and the characters a sense of authenticity. We, we don't live in a vacuum in our daily lives. They're, they're influenced by local and world events. The current situation is a perfect example. But I don't believe it should be any different for my fictional characters. I couldn't write a story set in Wallenby in the summer of 2019-2020 without... In, mentioning the bushfires, nor Easter 2020, because of the pandemic events. So I think that in the same way that factual events influence our lives, they should, have, they should influence the lives of my characters. So when I read or I'm told about an interesting story or an event, I think, oh, that fits in perfectly. I like to include it in my story. The assassination attempt on Prince Alfred in 1868 features in The Girl in the Painting. It led to a huge outpouring of anti-Irish sentiment, but it gave me the perfect opportunity to take my Irish characters out of Sydney to the goldfields. And I think that's realistic, although the story is fictional. I think it's, a, you know, it, it's the way hmm. life works. <clears throat> yeah. I think, um, I think it adds a lot. I mean, obviously it brings history alive. It adds a lot of authenticity to the story. It's all that detail and research um, that, that brings it alive. Um, and you, you often, you mentioned to me that you spend a lot of time hanging around in museums. Um, you spend a lot of time, I think, talking to people who, <laughs> who have stories to tell. Um, is research an enormous part of what you do for your book? I know it's true of most historical novelists, but how big a part of it is it for you and how does it work? I do spend a lot of time haunting museums and I do spend a lot of time <laughs> talking to people. Um, and, and I mean, many of the stories I hear or the things I see slip into my books. Um, I work down at Wollongby Museum or volunteer down at Wollongby Museum and, and I, somebody brought in an iron cradle and a wicker wheelchair 
several years ago um, while I was working down there. And they've been cleaning out their attic. You know, I mean, you always find things like that in your attic, don't you? And, <laughs> but it, I, at that time I was writing The Horse Thief and the entire plot changed because I had to have the cradle and I had to have the, I had to have the wheelchair in the story. So, you know, so, and the inspiration for my stories come from all sorts of different places. But I have noticed lately that there's this bit of a sort of an interconnecting research line that's going through all of the books. When I was writing um, The Natural Daughter, I had to find out, I had to work out how she could get this platypus, dead platypus, to England. <laughs> And I've got visions of it sort of slushing around in some great bell jar on the ship all the way to England, and I didn't fancy it at all. So I went down the taxidermy line, and I had to find out whether they taxidermied animals in the early 19th century. Um, and if so, what did they use, and could they get their hands on the, their, the ingredients if they were in Australia? Um, I found all that out, but I also found out a whole lot more about taxidermy, which appears as you've said, in The Woman in the Green Dress. Um, and in doing that, I found out about Toast and Rohu, two women, see, another two women who've been ignored by history, who ran a shop in Sydney. Um, and they were taxidermists, and they, um, they were very, very famous. They sold all of their stuff to museums and all over the place. And their shop... I based the shop on the woman in the green in the woman in the green dress on, but I also discovered that they send a lot of their their work to exhibitions from well, you know, London, Paris, New York, and also Maitland Technical College. Oh. And so, because they had an exhibition at Maitland Technical College, that went became one of the initial research fact, if you like, that sparked off the girl in the painting. And something that was in that exhibition in Maitland Technical College actually was the initial um, data for the book I'm writing at the moment. So there's this sort of ongoing pool, if you like, of research that, that lends itself to all sorts of bits and pieces. You, you mentioned Maitland and you mentioned, you know, um, Wollombi Museum. Um, sense of place is incredibly strong in your books. Uh, Sydney, yes, the UK occasionally, but particularly the very beautiful Hunter Valley around that area. Um, how important is it to you? Does it inform your writing to to a huge degree, or is it is it just simply serendipitous it's where you are? No, it's hugely important to me. Um, it's another character, or maybe even a set of set of characters. I, I think it's because I'm a, I'm a visual learner, so I think maybe I must be a visual writer or a visual plotter or or something like that. Um, and I I like I like to set my stories in the Hunter because it means I can walk the paths that my characters have walked. It might be an old track surrounding Wollombi. It could be the main street of, of Maitland or the Hawkesbury River. Great North Road, but it helps me get a sense of the story and to understand my characters. Um, I haven't, I haven't been back to the UK for many years, but the English places that crop up in my stories, um, Cornwall and London in The Naturalist Daughter and Somerset and Liverpool in The Girl and the Painting are the places that, of my childhood. So, um, yeah, place is absolutely yeah. integral to my stories. Yeah, and everything's material for a novelist, right? <laughs> yeah, um, always, thank always, you. always. <laughs> what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, thank you, Tia. That was a really um, great insight into the process. Um, Tia Cooper's next book, um, The Cartographer's Secret, will be out in November 2020. Um, all good bookstores. Um, if you'd like to hear more uh, from Tia or the other historical fiction authors who we've interviewed for our Her Story panel, please head to harpercollins.com.au forward slash Her Story. Tia's book is, of course, available to purchase from bookstores, including those that offer on uh, home deliveries. And, of course, you can buy the ebook from all good retailers. Thank you for joining us today.